Harry, but in the very early days, uh, I, I've read that you, you always had a, a keen interest in learning, not necessarily uh, the, enjoying the schools that you went to, but you always had a thirst for knowledge in that. And what was it about those early experiences that stimulated you to want to to uh, to learn and to, to to find answers to the variety of questions that were running around in your head? My father always kept a lot of um, books around. I mean, he had piles of books everywhere. Uh, partly that came from his experiences in prison, where he spent a lot of time reading. He mm -hmm. he had a formal third grade education, about a third, fourth grade education. But by the time he left prison, he was substantially self-educated. He always had a lot of books around. And he would constantly um, uh, tell us that you don't have to be uh, what this situation um, tells you you can be because the big people in our community were uh, the uh, school teachers at the segregated schools and the um, people who worked as janitors, as doormen. Some folks worked in, you know, at City Hall as uh, uh, cleanup people and one thing or another. And they had standing in the community. That was our middle class in so many ways. But on the other hand, there were doctors and lawyers and these people who also lived in the black community because they could not live anywhere else. Although we, uh, for the most part, didn't have a social relationship with them. We knew that they were there. Mm -hmm. And that's what... Um, my father always pointed toward, you don't have to be down here in the East St. Louis bottoms just because this is where you were born. This is where you uh, live. You are better than this. And so early on, because the books were around and he would always quote from books. He would quote entire poems. I remember him quoting Thanatopsis. I remember him quoting uh, Kipling's uh, If. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember him uh, talking about Edgar Allan Poe. I mean, all of this stuff that <laughs> kept it in, in our face, mm -hmm. even though uh, we didn't... Um, indulge it uh, at a at a level at a driven level he kept it in our face and he kept saying over and over again you're going to college you're going to college he had I mean he couldn't afford to send me across town to, to go to <laughs> East St. Louis High School but he kept this idea out there you're going to college you're going to go to college you're going to go to college and you're going to be somebody and uh, it's, it's funny uh, to, to, to show you how how um, how cold he was about the education piece. Uh, but it, when I got to junior high school, he, um, uh, all of my friends began dropping out. As soon as they could drop out, because a lot of them were already 15, 16, they just drop out. So all of my buddies had dropped out of school. They didn't come back that fall. So I came home and told my father, I don't want to go to school anymore. You know, I'm, he said, I said, well, why not? He said, I said, well, because Shine, um, he he got a job down at the hat shop and uh longhead uh got a job shining shoes uh up at uh, uh the 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 do drop in and so forth and they making money and everything and I'm sitting up there in 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 school he was reading the paper he never he sat up there he listened to the whole speech and he never even looked up <laughs> he just said um you going to school if I have to send you in an ambulance. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, that's how, that did it. That, yeah, was, that it. was it. Yeah, that End was the it. Story. Oh, that was it. Uh, and so, um, th that's the environment that I, uh, that I uh, grew up in. That was the environment that I grew up in. This, that was not derailed until the family fell apart. Uh, and he was in and out. My mother was gone completely. Um, I was going to a high school where the teachers, despite their best 
efforts, had absolutely no idea what to do with us. I remember my first day in English class, uh, I had, uh, uh, we had already been practicing football since August. School started in September. And me and a kid by the name of Claude Webb, another kid by the name of Donnie Brooks, were in this um, English class, Miss Clute's English class. And I mean, she was as sweet a teacher as you would ever want. And she walked into the class and the three of us were sitting in the front row of the, of the English class. And she looked and she said, are you all in the right class? And we looked at it and she said, yeah, well, here's the paper, here's, here's my assignment. So we gave her the assignment work. And we're sitting there. I was about six, four, six, five, about 240 pounds. Uh, Donnie Brooks was uh, 6'3", about 210. Claude Webb was 6'5", about 215. We're sitting there in the front row of the class. We just came in and took a seat. Mm -hmm. Mustaches mm -hmm. started to break through. And so she looked at the paperwork, and because I was the biggest, she looked at, I was also the youngest, she looked at me, and she said, how old are you? And so I'm sitting there about 6'5", 240-something, 14. <laughs> she <laughs> said, well, look, she said, well, I'll tell you what, you guys sit in the back row because the people behind you can't see. I mean, mm -hmm. so that, that, that was, that was how far out of kilter things were. They were not ready to deal, um, with, uh, Negro kids. Uh, they knew nothing about the culture. Uh, and it's not that some of them were not dedicated, committed. They simply didn't know what to do. So by the time my family broke up, my father was in and out going to a school where there was really not an emphasis on educating black kids because they didn't know what that meant. They didn't know how to get to that. Uh, the whole train just kind of left the track. And that's when I really began to drift, um, academically and intellectually. All right. Who were some of the special teachers that that you look back on now from grade school and junior high and high school that that really had a special effect on your educational growth? Well, uh, the most um, exciting time that I had educationally initially was uh, beginning in elementary school, Dunbar Elementary School, which was a totally black school. Um, we had, um, uh, before that, there was Denver Side Elementary School, which was a one-room school that had uh, a uh, first through uh, the third grade in one one building. Mm -hmm. And Miss Williams and Miss Colby at Denver Side taught me how to read, taught me how to write, taught me at a certain level how to speak because they always spoke what we used to call very proper. And mm -hmm, when we come mm -hmm. in, when we would come into the room uh, and they would ask us a question and we would stand up and start using a bunch of dems and there, there, you know, there were and this, I, I mean, they would, no, 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 that that's not the word that you want to use. They would correct us. So mm -hmm. they, the, the they had a tremendous impact. Miss Williams and Miss Colby had a tremendous impact on me. When I got to uh, Dunbar um, Elementary School, uh, starting in the third grade, I was in Mr. Duckworth's class, and he too had a phenomenal impact. He would take time out with students that he called promising minds. Um, there was uh, Miss Doja had a tremendous impact on me. She uh, uh, was staunch, talked in a real quick clip, and you knew when she said, Harry, that was it. That's mm -hmm. all she had mm -hmm. to say. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there was a little lady by the name of Miss uh, Wan, W-A-N-D. Mm -hmm. And she, Miss Wan must have been every bit of five feet, tall and she wore those shoes where you could hear her coming down the hall before you could see her. Before, long before you could see her. Yeah. you just see that you hear this sound and all mm. of a sudden this person but she uh ran a classroom that was so tight you knew when you when she walked in i don't care what was going on that was rapt attention every back was straight all eyes were straightforward because she did not uh mess around and you knew that this this is about learning. We're, we're here 
to learn. And if you didn't have your homework done, she would stay that evening with you while you did it. I mean, you might be there until six o'clock. She mm. hey, and and would send home the message from with your brothers and sisters. Tell uh, Mr. Edwards that Harry will not be coming home. He probably will be late for dinner this evening because we have some homework that we have to get. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this was, these were the teachers that I had I love in, it. Uh, I love in, it. Um, in 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 um, elementary and um, and junior mm -hmm. high school. So it, it was um, uh, th those were the people that really formed and framed uh, my um, uh, in, in intellectual um, curiosity. Mm -hmm. um, by when I got to um, Junior college, which is another whole, another whole story. Um, there was a history teacher who um, I had played basketball. I think we they had won had lost seven eight games in a row, and when I got on the team, they won five out of six or something like that. And my the, the semester that I was at Fresno, I set a national discus record uh, um, uh, and a school record, really, that stood for 41 years. Mm -hmm. uh, but there was a history teacher. Uh, I turned in my um, uh, second midterm in this history class, and this was after my first year in my, my, my one semester in junior college. And he looked at me and he said, I don't care how great an athlete you are. You have the ability to do the academics, and if you don't do it, I'm gonna give you an F. You're not gonna be eligible for academics. Mm -hmm. I mean, this was a guy, I don't even remember his name, and he was an older guy, but I said, Well, I'll be doggone. And again, that kicked back, plugged back into the Miss Wands, the Miss Dozias, the Mr. Duckworths, mm -hmm. the Miss Williams, the Miss Colby's, all of these people back. I said, Oh, I know. I know this guy. I understand what he's trying to say. And that was when at the college level, uh, coming out of junior college, that I really became uh, a student. And at some point, I don't remember exactly when, um, as a scholarship athlete at San Jose State, the academics became easy for me. Mm -hmm. I mean, it became not, it wasn't fun because there was so much work involved. But it became eminently enjoyable. And I used to love challenging the professors in my classes. In other words, they would make an assignment. First of all, I would read all of the books assigned in the class. But, uh, as soon as I got, I would just start reading because I, I got to the point that I just loved to read. And I would go beyond that and literally check the uh, footnotes in the book when an author makes a point. So when the professor would quote the author, I would raise my hand and say, but uh, he cites this footnote, but here's the actual footnote and what it stated, and that's not consistent with the point that he's trying to make. It got to the point in one of my classes where the professor would make a point, and then he would look at me and say, "Now, and Harry, don't you don't you think that that's don't you think that that's that, that, that's what the, the the core of what he was trying to say?" Mm -hmm. And uh, so I got to, it got to the point that I absolutely loved the academics, and of course the melding of the academics with my experiences in athletics was what really generated uh, my scholar activism and led me down this path toward taking a serious look at sport in society. Uh, my dissertation at Cornell, uh, which established the sociology of sport as an academic discipline, all of that stems from that nexus of academics and my uh, athletic uh, experiences really going back to high school. Mm -hmm.